Let's look at the environmental legislation and institutional measures in India. Now for the environmental legislations, the first legislation we are going to deal with is Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now, Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 is an act of the Parliament of India enacted for safeguarding our flora and fauna diversity. It is aimed towards protecting wild animals and plants and for matters connected therewith or ancillary or incidental thereto. The act covers the whole of India under its ambit. Now, salient features of WPA includes it provides for the establishment of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, etc. It paved way for the formation of Central Zoo Authority. Now, the Act lists six schedules which give varying protections to flora and fauna of the country. Those under Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 get absolute protection. Now, the Act provides for licenses for sale, transfer and possession of some wildlife species. Scheduled animals are prohibited from being traded as per the provisions of the Act. The Act also prohibits hunting of endangered species. Now, there are five types of protected areas established under the WPA 1972. These are wildlife sanctuaries, national parks, conservation reserves, community reserves, and tiger reserves. Now, let's study these in detail. The wildlife sanctuaries are declared by the state governments if the area was thought to be of adequate ecological, geomorphological, and natural significance. Now, national parks are declared again by the state government in addition to the declaration of wildlife sanctuaries. However, within the law, the difference in conservation value of national park and WLS is not specified. Now, let's look at the differences between national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. National parks enjoy a greater degree of protection than wildlife sanctuaries. Certain activities which are permissible in wildlife sanctuaries, example grazing, are prohibited in national parks. Now, wildlife sanctuaries can be created for a particular species, while national parks is not primarily focused on a particular species. While boundaries of a national park are fixed and defined, it is not the case with wildlife sanctuaries. National parks cannot be downgraded to the status of wildlife sanctuaries, but wildlife sanctuaries can be upgraded to the status of national park. Now, the chief wildlife warden may grant permissions to persons for entry, residence into the or a residence into the sanctuary for the study of wildlife, scientific research, photography, etc. Now, both central and state government can declare wildlife sanctuaries and national parks. Also, territorial waters can be included into area to be declared as wildlife sanctuaries or national park for the protection of offshore marine flora and fauna. Now, no alteration of the boundaries of the WLS, that is wildlife sanctuaries of national park, can be made except on the recommendation of National Board of Wildlife. Now, let's see conversation reserves and community reserves. They both are outcomes of amendments to the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now, conservation reserves uh, are those areas, particularly those adjacent to sanctuaries or parks that are declared such as conversation reserves after consulting the local communities. Now, the state government may declare any private or community land as community reserves after consultation with the local community or an individual who has volunteered to conserve the wildlife. Now, Goga Beel has been declared as Bihar's first community reserve. It is an Oxbow Lake in Bihar's Katihar district and is formed from the flow of River Mahananda in the north and Ganga is the south and east. Now, let's look at tiger reserves. The tiger reserves are declared on the recommendation of National Tiger Conservation Authority for the protection and conservation of tiger. Now, management effectiveness evaluation is the assessment of how well protected such area, areas such as national park, wildlife sanctuaries, conservation reserves, community reserves, and tiger reserves are being managed and their effectiveness in conserving flora and fauna. Now, like, let's look at the second most important environment legislation, which is the Environment Protection Act of 1986. Now, the Environment Protection Act of 1986 authorizes the central government to protect and improve environmental quality, control, and reduce pollution from all sources, prohibit or restrict the setting and or operation of any industrial facility on environmental grounds. The Act was enacted in 1986 with the objective of providing for the protection and improvement of environment. It empowers the central government to establish authorities charged with the mandate of preventing environmental pollution in all and its form to tackle specific environmental problems that are peculiar to different parts of the country. 
The act was last amended in 1991. In this act, environment is defined to include water, air, land, and interrelationships which exist among them. Now, the purpose of the act is to implement the decisions of the United Conference on Human Environment of 1972, which relates to the protection and improvement of human environment and prevention of hazards to human beings, other living creatures, plant, and property. The act has relaxed the rule of locus standi, and because of such relaxations, even a common citizen can approach the court with prior legal notice. Now, the Environment Protection Act grants immunity to officers of the government for any act done under the provisions of this act. It further debars civil courts from having any jurisdiction to entertain any suits, proceedings in respect of an action, direction, order issued by the central government or any other statutory authority under this act. Now let's move on to the Biological Diversity Act of 2002. Now the Biological Diversity Act of 2002 was born out of India's attempt to realize the objectives enshrined in the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, which recognizes the sovereign rights of the states to use their own biological resources. The act is aimed at the conversation of conservation of biological resources, managing its sustainable use, and enabling fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of use and knowledge of biological resources with local communities. The act envisaged a three-tier structure, that is, a national biodiversity authority as a statutory body at the national level, state biodiversity boards at the state level, and biodiversity management committees at the local levels. So authority, boards, and committees are established according to this act. Now, the act prohibits following activities without prior approval of the national board of National Biodiversity Authority. Now, any person or organization, either based in India or not, obtaining any biological resources occurring in India for its research or commercial utilization. The transfer of result of any research relating to any biological resource occurring in or obtained from India. Now, these are prohibited activities and they need prior approval from NBA. The claim of any intellectual property right on inventions based on research made on the biological resources obtained from India. Any grievances related to the determination of the benefit sharing or order of the NBA or SS SBBs under this act shall be taken to the National Green Tribunal. Now, as per National Biodiversity Authority, the following acts and rules are related to biodiversity. The Fisheries Act of 1897, Destructive Insects and Pests Act of 1914, the Agriculture Produce Grading and Marketing Act of 1937, Import and Export Control Act of 1947, Indian Forest Acts of 1927, Mines and Mineral Development Act Regulation that is of 1957. Now let's move on to the Scheduled Tribes and Other tribe Traditional Forest Dwellers Recognition of Forest Rights Act of 2006. Now the Forest Rights Act deals with the right of forest dwelling communities over land and other resources. The Act grants legal recognition to the rights of the traditional forest dwelling communities. Now, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs is the nodal agency for Im implementing the Act. Now, the rights enshrined under the FRA are forest management rights, title rights subject to a maximum of four hectares, right to minor forest produce, grazing, etc., relief and development rights like rehabilitation in case of eviction. Now, the eligibility to get rights under the Act is confined to those who primarily reside in the forest, who depend on forest and forest land for a livelihood. Further, the claimant must be a member of the ST community in scheduled in that area or must have been residing in the forest for 75 years prior to the cutoff date of 13 December 2005. Now, Gram Sabha or the Village Assembly is the initial authority which passes the resolution recommending whose right to which resources should be recognized. Now, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries have been included along with reserve forest and protected forest for the recognition of rights. The rights conferred under this act shall be heritable but not alienable or transferable. The act has also defined the term minor forest produce to include all non-forest, non-timber forest produce of the plant origin including bamboo, brushwood, stumps, cane, tassar, cocoons, honey, wax, lac, tendu leaves, etc. These are all non-timber forest produce. Now let's move on to National Forest Policy of 1988. 
Salient features of the policy are maintenance of environmental stability through preservation, restoration and ecological balance. Conservation of natural heritage of the country by preserving remaining forests. Checking soil erosion and extension of sand dunes. Increasing forest cover by afforestation, afforestation and development of wastelands. Meeting basic requirements of the people that is fuel, timber, food and encouraging wood substitutes. Efficient utilization of forest produce. Conservation of biological diversity, a network of national parks, biosphere reserves and other protected areas should be extended and properly managed. Now let's look at joint forest management. It is an approach and program initiated in the context of National Forest Policy of 1988 wherein state forest departments support local dwelling communities to protect and manage the forest and share the cost and benefits from the forest with them. Now let's look at draft national forest policy of 2018 aiming at the sustainable forest management by incorporating elements of ecosystem security, climate change, forest hydrology, robust framework to monitor and develop forest resources and strengthen an overall environmental balance. Its important provisions are that it envisages a community forest management mission, proposes private intervention in forest for maintaining quality, emphasizes the importance of urban forestation, and proposes setting up of National Board of Forestry for better management of country's forest. Now under green highway projects, that is plantation, transplantation, beautification and maintenance policy of 2015, Ministry of Road, Transport and Highways has decided that all existing national highways and 40,000 kilometers of additional roads in the next few years as green highways. Now 1% one one of the total cost per of the haul of all highway projects will be kept aside for highway plantation and its maintenance. Now let's look at coastal regulation zones. Now CRZs are classified into CRZ1, CRZ level 2, 3 and 4. Now CRZ level 1s are areas that are environmentally most critical and are further classified into classifications of A and B. Now class A includes the ecological sensitive areas like mangroves, corals, sand dunes, turtle nesting grounds, protected areas etc. Now uh, zone B includes intertidal zones. Now let's look at CRZ type 2, the developed land areas up or up to or close to the shoreline within the existing municipal limits or in other existing legally designated urban areas. Moving on to CRZ 3. Land areas that are relatively undistributed, undisturbed, sorry, which is rural areas and those do not fall under CRZ2. CRZ3 is further classified as CRZ3A and B. A is areas with population density of more than 2161 square kilometers as per per square kilometer as per the census of 2011, whereas B are those population areas with density less than 2161 per square kilometer. Now CRZ4, these constitute water areas and is further classified into CRZ4A and type B. The water areas and seabed areas between the LTL up to 12 nautical miles on the seaward side. Now B are the water areas and the bed areas between LTL at the bank of the tidal influence water body to the LTL on the opposite side of the bank extending from mouth of the water body at sea up to the influence of tide. Moving on, recently the government has approved the CRZ notification of 2018 based on the recommendation of Sailesh Nayak committee report. Now CRZ's notifications are produced under the Environment Protection Act of 1986. Now salient features of these notifications are floor space index norm which has been eased and restrictions it was imposed on it has been defrozen. No development zone that is NDZs of 20 meter have been stipulated for all, I all islands. Now NDZs has been reduced for densely populated areas under CRZ3. Now CRZ3 type A area shall have NDZ of 50 meters from high tide level 
on the leeward on the landward side whereas crz type b three type b areas shall have an ndc of 200 meters from the height at level now all ecological sensitive areas have been accorded special importance defense and strategic pro projects have been accorded necessary dispensation pollution abatement has been given due importance by permitting construction of treatment facilities in crz type 1 b areas with due safeguards now crz clearance have now been streamlined now crz clearance are needed only for type 1 and type 4 projects while state will have the power to grant clearances for crz type 2 and type 3 areas now temporary tourism infrastructure amenities will now be promoted such temporary tourism facilities will be permissible in the no development zone as well as crz3 areas now let's move on to the wetland conservation and management rules of 2017 wetland conservation and management rules of 2017 has been made for the effective conservation and management of wetlands in our country the key features of the rules are decentralization of management with delegation of power to the state governments now central wetland Author regulatory authority has been replaced by National Wetlands Committee. The state or union territory wetland authority will have to prepare a list of all the wetlands, develop a comprehensive list of activities to be regulated and permitted within the notified wetlands and their zone of influence. Now the rules also prohibit encroachment on wetlands, solid waste dumping, discharge of untreated waste and effluents from industries and human settlements, poaching, etc. on the other hand regulated activities include subsist subsistence level biomass harvesting subsist sustainable culture fishery practices plying of non motorized boats and construction of temporary nature it prescribes that the conservation conservation and management of wetland should be on the principle of wise use defined by ramsar convention however there is no provision of appealing to the ngt also the definition of wetland does not include river channels paddy fields man made water bodies tanks specifically for drinking water purposes and structures specifically constructed for aquaculture salt production recreation irrigation purposes now moef has notified guidelines for implementation of wetland conservation and management rules of 2017 wetlands are to uh, wetlands to be recruit, to be regulated include wetlands designated design, designated to the list of wetlands of international importance under the ramsar convention that is the ramsar list now wetlands notified under the rules by the state central government state government and union territory administrations all wetlands is irrespective of their location size ownership biodiversity or ecosystem value can be notified under the wetland rules except river channels paddy fields certain categories of human made water bodies among others these are the exceptions now moving on we have protected areas and areas falling within the purview of coastal regulation zones which have been excluded from the notification under wetland rules now state wetland authority will be set up with the minister in charge of environment in the state acting as the chairperson of the authority now the list of wetland is to be developed on wetland definition based on the definition of ramsar convention for each wetland to be notified a zone of influence is to be defined now let's look at the solid waste management rules of 2016 these re rules replace the municipal solid waste management and handling rules of 2000 its silent feature include the rules are now applicable now beyond municipal areas and include urban agglomerations census towns notified industrial townships etc the source segregation of wet waste has been mandated generator will have to pay user fee to waste collector and spot fine for littering and non segregation rules mention for time frame for setting up solid waste processing facilities by all local bodies every waste generator shall segregate and store the waste generated by them in three separate streams namely biodegradable non biodegradable and domestic hazardous waste ministry of urban development shall formulate national policy and strategy on solid waste management the department of fertilizer ministry of chemicals shall promote marketing and utilization of compost they also pro promote setting up of waste to energy plants 
Now let's look at the hazardous and other waste management and transboundary movement amendment rules of 2019. Now the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has amended the hazardous and other waste management and transboundary movement rules of 2016. Some of the salient features of the amendment rule amended rules include solid waste plastic waste has been prohibited from import into the country including in special economic zones and by export oriented units now exporters of silk waste now have been given exemptions from requiring permissions of the moefccs also electric and electronic assemblies and components manufactured and, and exported from india if found defective can now be imported back into the country within a year of export without obtaining permission from MOEFCCs. Now, industries which do not require consist, consent under Water Air Act of 1981 are now Water Act is of 1974 and Air Act is of 1981 are now exempted from requiring authorization under the hazardous and other waste management and transboundary rules of 2016. Provided that the hazardous and other waste generated by such industries are handed over to authorized actual users, waste collectors, or disposal facilities. Now let's move on to the construction and demolition waste rules of 2016. Now some of the salient features of the rules are prescribes duties of the gen waste generators like segregation, segregating construction and demolition waste and depositing it at collection centers. It also provides duties of service providers and contractors. It prescribes the time frame for the implementation of the rules. Now let's look at the biomedical waste management rules of 2016. Some of the silent features of the rules are the ambit of the rule has been expanded to include vaccination camps, blood donation camps, surgical camps, or health or any other healthcare activities. It calls for phasing out of chlorinated plastic bags, gloves, and blood bags within two years. It calls for pretreatment of laboratory waste. My, microbiological waste, blood samples and blood bags. It seeks to provide training to all its healthcare workers and immunize all health workers regularly. It seeks to establish a barcode based system for bags and containers containing biomedical waste for disposal. As per the rules, biomedical waste have been classified into four categories that is untreated human anatomical waste, animal anatomical waste, solid wa soiled wastes and biotechnology waste. As per the rules, the state government shall provide land for setting up of biomedical waste treatment and disposal facilities. E-waste management rules of 2016. Now another e-waste management rule has come in 2022. So let's look at the rules from 2016. The new e-waste rules include CFLs and other mercury containing lamps as well as other equipments. For the first time rules brought producers under the EPR that is extended producer responsibility, making them responsible for the collection of e-waste and its exchange. Now, various producers are, can have a separate producer responsibility organization and ensure collection of e-waste as well as their disposal in an environmental friendly manner. Now, deposit refund scheme has been introduced as an additional economic instrument under the which the producers charges us charges an additional amount as a deposit at the time of the sale of the electrical and electronic equipment and returns it to the customer along with interest when the end of the life of electronical and electro electronic waste equipment is returned. Now phase wise collection targets for e-waste has been introduced. The role of the state government have also been introduced in the rules to ensure safety, health and skill development of workers involved in dismantling and recycling operations. Urban local bodies have been assigned the duty of to collect, channelize the orphan products to authorize dismantlers or recyclers. Now the amendment rules of 2018 has added the reduction hazard system uh, that is ROHS provisions under which cost of sampling and testing shall be borne by the government for conducting the ROHS test and if the product does not comply with the ROHS provisions then the cost of the test will be borne by the producers. Now let's move on to the plastic waste management rules of 2016. Some of the salient features of the rules are increase the minimum thickness of the plastic waste plastic bags from 40 microns to 50 microns and stipulate minimum thickness of 50 microns for plastic sheets also to facilitate collection and recycling of plastic waste. Now it also wants to expand the applicability of jurisdiction from municipal areas to rural areas. It wants to promote the use of plastic waste for road construction as per the Indian Road Congress guidelines or energy recovery or waste to oil etc. for general utilization of 
waste and also address the waste disposal issue. First time, responsibility of waste generators like individuals and bulk generators like offices have been introduced to introduce collection of waste, plastic waste management fee through pre-registration of producer impos, importers of plastic carry bags, multi-layered packaging, vendor selling the same for establishing the waste system. Now, extended producer responsibility has been introduced. Central Pollution Control Board has been mandated to formulate guidelines for thermoset plastics. Now the 2016 rules were amended in 2018. Now the 2016 rules were amended in 2018, laying emphasis on phasing out multi-layered plastic, which are non-recyclable or non-energy recoverable with no alternate use. Now the amendment amended rules also prescribe a central registration system for the registration of producer, importer, and bond owner. A national, a national registry has been prescribed for producers with a presence in more than two states and a state level registration has been prescribed for smaller producers and brand owners operating within one or two states. Now let's look at some of the miscellaneous provisions. Now let's look at some of the provisions of Indian Forest Act of 1927. It was enacted to consolidate all previous laws regarding forest and extend state's control over forest as well as Diminishing the status of people's right to forest use, the Act regulated the movement and transit of forest produce and duty levyable on timber and other forest produce. It also defined forest offences. The Act classified forest into reserved forest, protected forest and village forest. Amending the Indian Forest Act, bamboo grown in non-forest areas have been exempted from the definition of trees to promote it commercial cultivation. Now, the Mines and Mineral Development Regulation Act of 1957 was enacted to regulate the mining sector in India. The Act is applicable to all minerals except mineral minerals and atomic minerals. Mine and minerals, example, river sand, comes under the purview of state government. For mining in forest lands, prior permission of Environment Ministry is required. Now, let's look at the Pradhan Mantri Khanit Chetra Kalyan Yojana, that is PM Triple KY. It is aimed at mitigating the adverse impacts during and after mining on environment, health, social economic conditions of the people in mining districts and also to ensure a sustainable livelihood for the affected people. It is being implemented by the district mineral foundations with of the respective districts that use the funds collected by the DMF for my, from the miners. Now, 60% of the funds will be utilized for high priority areas such as drinking water supply and 40% of the fund will be utilized for areas like physical infrastructure, irrigation, energy and watershed development. Now, DMF is a trust set up under the Mines and Minerals Amendment Act of 2015 as a non-profit body in those districts affected by mining operations. Now, green Tribunal, that is the National Green Tribunal, is a statutory boundary established in 2010 to handle the expeditious disposal of cases pertaining to environmental issues. It was enacted in consonance with right to healthy environment under the Article 21 of the Constitution. Now let's look at some of the institutional measures. The National Afforestation and Eco Development Board was constituted by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in 1992. The National Afforestation Program, that is the flagship program of National Afforestation and Eco Development Board, was launched in 2002. It involves plantation in degraded lands across the country. Now let's look at Compensatory Afforestation Fund Management and Planning Authority, that is CAMPA. To compensate the loss of forest area to maintain environment sustainability, government announced a well-defined act known as CAMPA. Now the provisions of the act are the law establishes the national compensatory afforestation fund under the public account of india and a state compensatory afforestation fund under the public account of each states these funds will receive payment from compensatory afforestation net present value of the forest other project specific payments now the national fund will receive 10 percent of these funds and state fund will receive the rest that is 90 percent According to the Act, a company diverting forest land must provide alternative land to take up compensatory afforestations. 
Now, the National Clean Energy Fund has been created out of the cess on coal produced imported under the polluter prey principles. Now, the fund lies under the public account with its secretariat in the Department of Expenditure in the Ministry of Finance. It is an intergovernmental group which is chaired by the finance secretary and finance Sec secretary recommends projects eligible for funding under NCEF. Now, FSI, that is Forest Survey of India, is an organization set up under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. It was established in 1981 and is headquartered at Dehradun. Now, FSI is responsible for assessment and monitoring of the forest resources of the country regularly. Now, Indian State of Forest Report is a biennial, biennial publication of FSI. So, this is important. India's State of Forest Report, it is published by Forest Survey of India. Which has its capital, which has its headquarters in Dehradun. Now, Botanical and Zoological Survey of India is an institution set up by the government of India in 1890. The objective is to identify plant resources of this country. Now, Zoological Survey of India is an institution set up by the government of India in 1916 to explore and research the fauna. The history of ZSI goes back to the Asiatic Society of Bengal, founded by Sir William, William Jones in 1784. It is the mother of it is the mother institution of institutions like Indian Museum, ZSI, Geological Survey of India, etc. Now BSI and ZSIs are headquartered at Kolkata and comes under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now let's look at Central Groundwater Authority. It was constituted under the Environment Protection Act of 1986. However, it is not a statutory body. Now, CG, CGWA has the mandate of regulating underground water development and its management in the country. India is the largest user of groundwater in the world, which in turn has led to over-exploitation. Hence, CGWA has notified guidelines for groundwater extraction for industries, introduction of water conservation fee, mandatory requirement of digital flow meter, that is piezometer, and mandatory water audit by specific specified industries extracting groundwater. Now, mandatory rooftop rainwater harvesting except for specified in industries. Now, exemption from this requirement of NOC has been granted to sectors like agricultural users, users employing non-energized means to extract water, individual households using less than one inch diameter delivery pipe, and armed forces during operational deployment. Now let's look at the Central Water Commission. Uh, now CWC is a premier technical organization of India in the field of water resources and is presently functioning as an attached office of Ministry of Water Resources, River Development and Ganga Rejuvenation. Now the commission is entrusted with general responsibilities of initiating, coordinating and furthering, furthering consultations of the state government concerned. Scheme for control, conservation, utilization of water resources throughout the country for the purpose of flood control, irrigation, navigation, drinking water supply, and water power development. It also undertakes the investigation, construction, and execution of such schemes as required. Now, Animal Welfare Board of India was established in 19, 1962 under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. It is a statutory advisory body on the on animal welfare law which promotes animal welfare in the country. It works to ensure the animal welfare law are followed in the country and provide grants to animal welfare organizations. Now the board comes under the jurisdiction of Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Daring and is headquartered at Ballabgarh in Haryana. Now let's look at Central Zoo Authority. Central Zoo Authority has been constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and is responsible for oversight of zoos. Every zoo in the country is required to obtain recognition from the authority for its operation. Now the power of, author power of the authority of zoo, that is the Central Zoo Authority, it includes recognition and derecognition of zoos, permission for acquisition of wild animals, cognizance of offences, grants of licenses, certificate of ownerships and recognitions, etc. Now, Central Zoo also provides technical and financial assistance to such zoos, which has the potential to attain desired standards in animal management. Now, let's look at National Biodiversity Authority. National Biodiversity Authority was established in 2003 to implement India's Biological Diversity Act. It is a statutory autonomous body and it performs 
regulatory advisory functions for government of india in issues of conservation sustainable use biological resources and fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising out of the use of biological resources now nbhx biopiracy protects the indigenous and traditional genetic resources anybody seeking any kind of ipr on a research based upon biological resources or knowledge obtained from india requires prior approval of nba now no person who has been granted approval shall transfer any biological resource or knowledge associated to other except with the permission of nba now the state biodiversity boards also regulates by granting approvals or otherwise request for commercial utilizations of bio survey and bio utilization of any biological resources by indians now let's look at wildlife crime control bureau Now the Wildlife Con Crime Control Bureau is a statutory multidisciplinary body established by Government of India under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to combat organized wild crime, wildlife crime in the country. The bureau has its headquarters in New Delhi and has five regional offices in Delhi, Kolkata, Mumbai, Chennai, and Jabalpur. Now it is mandated to collect and collate intelligence related to wildlife crimes establish a centralized wildlife crime database bank and coordinate with foreign authorities for wildlife crime control and assist the government in wildlife policy making now wildlife control crime control bureau also assists and advises the custom authorities in inspection of consignments of flora and fauna as per the provisions of wildlife protection act sites an export import policy governing such an item now let's look at wildlife trust of india it is an ngo founded in 1998 it aims at conserving nature especially endangered species and threatened habitats in partnership with communities and government now wti is committed to the product protection of indian wildlife and is achieving this by working in partnership with local communities and government Let's look at National Board for Life Wildlife. The National Board of Wildlife is a statutory organization constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. It is chaired by the Indian Prime Minister. It advises the central government on framing framing policies and measures for wildlife conser conservation. No alteration of boundaries in national park and wildlife sanctuaries can be made without its approval. Now other government initiative include Ganga conservation measures National Ganga Council under the chairmanship of prime minister replaced the erstwhile National Ganga River Basin Authority empowered task force on river ganga was set up under the chairmanship of union minister of water resources river development and ganga rejuvenation National Mission for Clean Ganga will have two tier structures with a governing council and an executive committee now the National Mission for Clean Ganga will exercise power under the environmental Environment Protection Act it can also fine polluters however national mission on clean ganga will only take action in case of non compliance if central pollution control buzz board does not do so now namami ganga program is an integrated conservation mission under the national mission of clean ganga with a budget outlay of 2000 crore 20000 crore to accomplish the twin objectives of an effective abatement of pollution along with the conservation and rejuvenation of ganga initiatives under namami gange include ganga gram yojana under which 100 1600 villages situated along the banks of the rivers will be developed ganga task force will be created now swachh yug campaign has been launched to make villages along ganga open defecation free so odf is the target here now the government uh, uttarakhand high court has declared ganga as a living entity meaning it will enjoy all rights duties liabilities of a living person the move by high court is a step towards generating awareness on increasing issues of water pollution it is for the first time in india that a natural element has been declared as a legal person however the concept of natural nature having legal rights is not new and is already being practiced in countries like ecuador and new zealand Now let's look at the green skill development program of ministry of environment forest and climate change it is an in initiative for skill development in environment and forest sector to enable india's youth to get get gainful employment or self employment all courses are 
National Silk Qualification Framework compliant. Environment Information System is a central sector scheme being implemented by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change since 1982-83. The focus of ENVIS since inception has been on providing environmental information to decision makers, policy planners, scientists, engineers, research workers, etc. Now let's look at the Green Good Deeds campaign launched by MOEF. It is a social movement to protect the environment and promote healthy living. Now the National Bamboo Mission will be a sub-scheme of National Mission on Sustainable Agriculture under the umbrella scheme of Krishunoyuti Yojana. The mission envisages promoting holistic growth of bamboo sector by adopting area-based, area regionally differentiated strategy to increase the area under bamboo cultivation and marketing. Now, Lighting a Billion Lives is a campaign by Terry to promote use of solar lanterns which are specially designed and manufactured on a decentralized basis. Now, Urban Services Environmental Rating System User is a project funded by UNDP, executed by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, implemented by Terry. It is aimed at improving basic services like water supply and sewerage. Ecomark is a certification issued by Bureau of Indian Standards, that is BIS, to products conforming to a set of standards aimed at least impact on ecosystem. Now, the Indo-French Center for Promotion of Advanced Research launched a monthly disciplinary Indo-French research project titled Adaptation of Irrigated Agriculture for Climate Change, AICHA. It aims at developing an integrated model for analyzing the impact of climate change on groundwater irrigated agriculture in South India. Now, Forest Converse Conservation Act of 1980 was enacted to counter India's rapid deforestation resulting environmental degradation. Under the provisions of this act, prior approval of the central government is required for diversion of forest land for non-forestry purpose. Critical wildlife habitat are envisaged under Forest Rights Act 2006. They are defined under the act as areas of national park and sanctuaries that are to be kept safe and inviolate for the purpose of wildlife conservation. While Ministry of Tribal Affairs is implementing authority of FRA, the Act identifies Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change as the agency to notify the guidelines. Baiga tribes of Madhya Pradesh become, became the first tribe to get habitat rights under the Act. 